Hello again, and welcome to another episode of the Bible and One Year with the Preacher's Husband. Today we're going through Isaiah 1 through 4. Tomorrow we're going through Isaiah 5 through 8. So let's jump into Isaiah. This was written by, the book of Isaiah was written by Isaiah, son of Amos. And we see that in verse 1 of chapter 1. This is written around 680 BC-ish, give or take. And big picture here is that Isaiah prophesied that because of continued idolatry, God was going to send Judah into Babylonian captivity, yet he would graciously restore them through the work of his servant who would bear away their sins by his death. wonder who that could be. Hmm. In summary, Isaiah's book is divided into two major sections, the book of Judgment, which is chapters 1 through 39, and the book of Comfort, which is chapters 40 through 66. The first part of the book, the book of Judgment, it emphasizes sin, the call to repentance, and judgment, and then while the second part, it emphasizes the hope of restoration. In the first part of the book, Assyria is the menace. The northern kingdom eventually will fall to the Assyrians, and the Assyrians would then threaten the southern kingdom. Isaiah encouraged Judah's kings not to trust in political alliances with Assyria, Egypt, or the Babylonians, but to trust in the Lord instead. In the second part of the book, chapters 40 to 66, the Jews were held captive in Babylon, and they are the focus of Isaiah's words of comfort, reconciliation, and restoration. Um, well, let's get into it. Some of the, I'm just going to point out a few things that stuck out to me right off the bat in verses 1 and 2. Um, because the Bible portrays people as responsible beings called to respond in faith and obedience to God's revelation, the Bible often portrays sin in terms of defiance and rebellion towards God the King. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 2 is one of many passages that describes sin in terms of rebellion against God. I have raised children and brought them up, but they have rebelled against me, as it says here. Seen in this light, sin is a personal and willful disobedience, the raising of a clenched fist, so to speak, toward the one who made us. Also, verse 3 stood out to me. Verse 3, God stood amazed at the stupidity of his people. They were dumber than an ox, according to this verse. They were even dumber than a donkey, according to this verse, too. The former was smart enough to recognize its owner. And the latter, although he might not recognize its owner, he definitely knew where he got its food from when he was looking for He, he knew where the trough was, the food trough, for sure. So there's that. Um, verse 27 stood out to me as well. I went and read this in the New King James Version. In verse 27 here, it says, Zion shall be redeemed with justice and her penitence with righteousness. Penitence with righteousness. Hmm. I'm reminded of Charles Colston, Colson. He was a special counsel to President Richard Nixon and founder of Prison Fellowship. And he stated this. He said, Imprisonment as a primary means of criminal punishment is relatively is a relatively modern concept. It was turned to as a humane alternative to the old patterns of harsh physical penalties for nearly all crimes. Quakers introduced the concept in Pennsylvania. The first American prison was established in Philadelphia when the Walnut Street Jail was converted into a series of solitary cells where the offenders were kept in solitary confinement. The theory was that they would become penitents, like we saw in this, in, in this verse here, and her penitence with righteousness. Confessing their crimes before God, they would, they would become penitents, confess their crimes before God, and thereby gaining a spiritual rehabilitation of sorts. Hence the name penitentiary, or a place for penitence. I find that to be very interesting and appropriate at this point. Chapter 2, verse 4 stood out to me as well. This pronouncement is, if you look at verses 2 through 4 as a whole, this is almost virtually identical to that is found in Isaiah's um, contemporary 
the prophet Micah. If you look in Micah chapter 4 verses 1 through 3, it's almost the same as verses 2 through 4 here in Isaiah chapter 2. But verse 4 stood out to me. It says, The nation seeking the Lord will experience a great transformation of sorts in this verse and that they will not exert their energies or waste their resources on destructive things like swords and spears, but instead they're going to focus their productivity on productive activities such as plowing and pruning and knives and things like that. Things that are productive as opposed to things that are destructive. And what also stood out to me was that Richard M. Nixon placed his hand on Isaiah chapter 2, verse 4, as he took the presidential oath of office in 1969 and in 1973. And of course, I got a picture of a penitentiary up here. This is Alcatraz, of course, the famous penitentiary that does not function anymore. Hmm. Was it interesting that I put a penitentiary up there as I talked about Richard Nixon? I'll let you decide. <laughs> so anyway, we move on in Isaiah. Chapter 3, um, verses 4 and 5 stood out to me. Basically, I'm just thinking about these two verses. And um, with the removal of leaders in whom the people trust comes the installation of inexperienced youth here. And that replaces all of the wisdom of the ages. The result would be social chaos and oppression, something that is seen over and over again in the world when this happens. Um, the next thing that stood out to me was chapter 4, verse 1. Basically, this, this verse right here is referring to... Um, it says, on that day, seven women will seize one man, saying, we will eat our own bread and provide our own clothing. Just let us bear your name. Take away our disgrace. So, at this point, war is supposed to severely reduce the male population of Jerusalem. There would not be enough men to marry all the women, so the women without husbands were socially vulnerable. Thus, Seven women will beg a single man to make them his wives. He would not even need to provide their food or their clothing, according to this verse. Something that was actually mandated even for the unloved secondary wives in Exodus chapter 21, verses 10 and 11, if you want to look back at that. What else stood out to you? Well, I've got up here is a map of the world. And I was referring to that verse here. It said that there will be a time where there will be seven women to every man, but essentially. Well, that's not the case in the world today. Actually, worldwide, if you look at this, all the red indicates countries where women are more populous than men and of course we are we have more women in the united states than we have men but not by much it's actually 97 men to every 100 women in the united states right now and that's not solid down the board like there's more men boys that are born ages zero to four and that and there's usually 104 to every hundred woman right up until the point you hit your 40s and at the round around about you get to age 40 45 to 49 and up that's when the women take over and the men drop off dramatically because we don't live as long. But on average, there's a hundred women to every 97 men in the United States. Look at those blue areas. That's where there's more men than there are women. I found that to be interesting. But worldwide, there's about 3.7 men to every 3.6 women. So if you want to put that into perspective, worldwide. So there's... Point 0.1 more women. <laughs> uh, point 0.1 more men. So there's actually more men right now than there are women. So biblically, we're not in that spot. But Jerusalem is supposed to, to be in that spot at some point as we go through our Bible in one year with the preacher's husband. I hope this has touched you. If it has, of course, subscribe to the channels. Give us a rumble or a like. And of course, Hit the notification button so you get notified the next time I upload a video, which will be tomorrow for another episode of the Bible. And one year with the preacher's husband. We'll see you then.